are back with another exciting episode of the College Tailgaters, and what an episode it's going to be. My name is Chris America, coming to you from the sunny Orlando, Florida. Got the windows open, the breeze is coming in nice, and coming to me from Illinois is my co-host, Mr. Sean Daly. How you doing, Sean? Uh, doing great, Chris. Like you said, I'm Sean Daly. You can find me uh, on Twitter at Tailgater Sean. You can find the show at Tailgaters Pod. We're on iTunes, Podbean, everywhere you can find podcasts. We're on the 12 uh, dot com and 12 Ounce Sports on the uh, TuneIn app. Yeah, we're on the 12 Ounce Sports TuneIn app. Our show comes, I think, on Mondays. And got good news, Sean. We're going live. Scout Team Sports is going live this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. That is 6.30 Central Standard Time over there in Illinois for you. So make sure you tune in. I'm looking forward to having you on. I think we discussed about having you come on a little bit. We're going to try and get the whole scout team radio family on to celebrate our first live episode, man. I'm excited about it. Who is giving you degenerates a live mic, live airtime? Are you kidding me? Uh, that's what happens when you just meet people online and you just give them too much trust. Uh, Jeff Beck, <laughs> the, the runner of this 12 ounce sports radio, that's where we're going to be at at 12OunceSportsRadio.com or the 12 Ounce Sports Radio Tune In channel. So, I mean, maybe we'll just have one episode and he'll never want us on again. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. It's exciting. Uh, happy for you guys. That's awesome. Um, definitely everyone go download that Tune In app so you can listen live. Yeah, if you're wanting to know how to keep in contact with us or find out where are all of our events and shows are going to be, Go to Scout Team Radio or at Scout Team Radio on Twitter, or you can just follow me. I'm usually pretty active with sarcasm and tweets about sports news and just pretty much whatever the hell I come up with, whatever random thought I have. I'm giving those out at, at Chris Scout Team. Um, and then, of course, we have the at Tailgaters pod. I think we need to get a little bit better at making that one more active. I get... I get so wrapped up in my own account and Scout Team Radio and then all the other stuff I got going on in life that Tailgaters Pod, the the account, kind of becomes like a little redheaded stepchild that we forget about. I know. I try not to use that one for, like, opinion things. Get a little more freedom on your personal one. Right, of so. course. But, I mean, like, maybe we could just start tweeting out more stuff about uh, about games and stuff going on. We had We had a lot of big games that we'll get to, but the biggest story this week... And really the last two or three weeks has been this MS, MSU, Michigan State, and Larry Nasser. Is it Nasser or Nassar? I heard a, a news Nasser. guy call it Nassar the other day, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if I've been saying it wrong. No, in the court stuff, they said Nasser, so that's what I was going with. Um, but yeah, my God. So we all know what's been going on with Larry Nasser. We all saw on TV the uh, sentencing and all that. But in the last you know week or two here, we've had the president of Michigan State, Luanna Simon, has stepped down. Uh, defiantly. I don't know if you saw her statement or not, but she's still kind of trying to shirk some of the blame. Uh, yeah, it was one of the most selfish, toot your own horn type resignation, which you expect when you're resigning under normal circumstances. But under these circumstances, man, like have some decorum, have some have some wherewithal as to what's going on. Don't make this about you. Maybe in a year or so, when your name is cleared, if it is cleared, if you aren't guilty of anything, then maybe you get on with, I don't know, not Barbara Walters. She's not doing anything anymore, but uh, who's the who's the one guy for ESPN that always does those serious sit-down Bob talks? Lee. Bob Lee. Sit down with Bob Lee, or who's the other guy, the one that always does the really serious interviews and the really serious reports? Costas? No, not Bob Costas. He's for ESPN. I'll think of it. I'll look it up. He's the one that sat down with um, Art, Art Rinaldi. Bryles. Rinaldi, there it is. Tom Rinaldi. Boom. He always starts it off with, it was a cold day in Tennessee. Yeah. The students were coming back to school. It was like any other day. Anyway, so when you have that sit down, that's when you can say, look, my name was cleared. I did all these great things. I feel sorry, but not in the middle of this. Not after 160 women just gave out heart-wrenching, disgusting testimonies. You want to make it about how much you've given to the basketball court and and everything else. It's just disgusting. It seemed like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the classic uh, American film, uh, Half-Baked, but like when he quits his fast food job and he's just like, F-U, 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 you're cool, F-U. Like, yeah. She's just like, 
like has no part in it. And like, regardless of if she covered anything up or not, like to me with her, uh, with the AD Mark Hollis who stepped down and even to an extent with Mark D'Antonio and Tom Izzo is not knowing anything. Does that demonstrate a lack of institutional control? Like, even if you're not covering anything up, like not being aware of anything, isn't that almost like that's still a sin as far as that goes, right? No, it is. Um, like you're incompetent. You're just saying you're incompetent at your job. Right. I, I said on the scout team sports this past week, it's one thing if it was four or five women that were assaulted by this guy and it happened in a year period of time. But this is 160 plus victims. And it was, I think the first report that we know of was all the way back in 1997. So this is a 20 year ongoing. And like you said, even if you didn't know, that's that's bad on your part because this was going on on your campus for 20 years and you didn't know. And Michigan State, has just the whole entire way has just responded wrong. All they've been doing is trying to protect themselves. I thought the way that the U S Olympic committee handled it, they basically said, look, everybody on this U S uh, U S gymnastics committee, you need to be out by January 31st or we're taking further actions. And guess what? Earlier this week, everybody on that committee board stepped down. Did you hear any of those committee board members come out and say, we resign and, this is a witch hunt, and I did everything right. No, you just – all you heard was they stepped down. That was it. Michigan State, on the other hand, they're taking – they're they're fighting and clawing and screaming. They don't – they don't want – I mean, I get it to an extent, but realize what you're doing. And, and like uh, our boy Clayton Windsor from uh, podcast BSR Basement Sports Report said on our show, act right. Do the right thing here. And now let's move on to the NCAA. They're finally investigating this thing. That took them however long to finally decide that they wanted to get involved. And I think the NCAA needs to act right. What do you think should happen to Michigan State if they're found to be negligent in this in this case? See, that's tough because I don't know that the NCAA in this case is going to come out totally clean. They said Mark Emmert, uh, head of the NCAA, who's a total clown, uh, he was informed of at least three dozen assaults back in 2010 at Michigan State, and they didn't start an investigation. Uh, Michigan State, for their part, has done a lot to sweep everything under the rug. Um, if you read the report that uh, I forget the the woman's name, but she ran like the sexual assault stuff at uh, Michigan State. And she's the one who talked to uh, outside the lines, got this whole report going. But names of athletes were routinely withheld um, from like all documents involving sexual or domestic violence. But what authority, I guess I'm getting to here, is what authority does Mark Emmert and the NCAA, who might not come out clean from all this, have to police, you know, Michigan State? Who's policing the NCAA is what I want to know. I assume they're going to get something similar to what Penn State got with a hefty fine. I say hefty, $60 million is a drop in the bucket to Penn State, but probably postseason uh, bans as well as uh, loss of some scholarships. Hopefully it falls uh, more on the Penn State side of things than the Baylor side where they didn't even get any sanctions. Yeah, I'm it's we're at the tip of the iceberg, I think, with this thing. And we'll learn it's more and more too early for any sanctions. Right. Well, for us to have like an opinion on what happened and everything, we're we don't have enough information right now. We have a lot of like I said, the tip of the iceberg type information, but there's a whole massive thing going under here. And if what you're saying is true that what does the NCAA have what authority do they have to police this because they're just as involved or just as guilty as Michigan State? Then, God, I, the libertarian in me hates to say this, but then I guess we need to go one step further and get senators and congressmen involved. What what power does Title IX have over the right. NCAA? Because this is getting old. This is it, – it was one thing with Penn State. We were completely shocked the first time we heard about Penn State. Um, then Baylor and FSU come around. You got – you got Jameis Winston, you know, you have that whole story. But then even around that time, there were news reports with the Orlando Sentinel about how there was 24 rape cases that were swept under the rug with FSU. And I hate to say this, but FSU benefited from the fact that Baylor looked at FSU and said, hold my beer. We're going to one up you on this. And the, the, the attention on Winston and everything quickly shifted from FSU to Baylor because what was going on at Baylor was even more 
egregious and disgusting. And like you said, Baylor got nothing handed down to them. The NCAA just kind of cleaned their hands of it and said, this isn't our place. Now you have NCAA reluctantly investigating Michigan State. And this has to fall on the NCAA. If the schools aren't going to police themselves, if the schools aren't going to take care of this responsibly like they should, then somebody does need to take care of it because this is getting old. I, I, and I, I feel like me saying that doesn't do it justice or does it a disservice as to what's going on, but who's the next school? I mean, when, it, how many schools have to be found doing this kind of thing before we as a society say, Enough is enough. I mentioned personally, if the NCAA doesn't do anything, I think these conferences need to do something. I said that, hey, if you're found doing this kind of thing, you don't belong in the Big 12. You don't belong in the ACC. You don't belong in any conference, really, because I'd hate to see you get kicked the curb from the, the Big 10 and then the American Conference picks you up. No, like you just have to be an independent school for, I don't know, five years, and then maybe the Big 10 or other schools will reevaluate, but I just don't feel like you get to to participate because what happened to Penn State didn't deter FSU, Penn St- or sorry, FSU, Baylor, or Michigan State from continuing this kind of behavior. Yeah, it's uh it'd be interesting. I mean I think schools like Michigan State and uh Florida State might make more money as independents, so that may not be even that big of a punishment to them. I don't they know can go the Notre Dame route. Um I don't know. I don't know that that's true. Otherwise, they I mean, would, they would the all be going independent. But... Like, um, I don't I don't know what it is. I just don't think if if a head coach can get fired for calling escort services, if a if an athlete can get kicked off a team for stealing a laptop, I think it's time that these conferences show a strong stance against this type of behavior by these schools. And like I said, you you had mentioned you know Penn State is is in a much better place now than they were before. And usually punishments aren't for aren't just for the uh, the person that did the crime. It's also to deter others from doing the same crime. When you look and you say, "Oh, that guy broke into a house and only only got two days in jail," well, that's worth it. I can probably if I get away with it, that's fine. I, I'll take two days in jail if I don't. Whereas if the punishment is ten years in jail, no, nah, I'm not gonna. I saw that guy get caught and got ten years. Uh, breaking into this house isn't worth it. Yeah, the, the sanctions are always tough because they always seem to punish the people not responsible. So you have, you know, members of the Penn State football team or incoming freshmen who is their dream their whole life to go play football at Penn State. Right. And now they get reduction in scholarship, postseason banned for something they had nothing to do with, something they weren't there for. Right. And now they have to make the choice. Do I go somewhere else? Do I change my dream? Um, I think if there's any sanctions coming out of this, it's going to come from the Title IX department because... Michigan State had started a Title IX investigation on Larry Nasser. I forget the exact year, but years ago they started, and they did not report that to the uh, the federal reg- – whoever regulates the Title IX, they did not report that they had begun the investigation. So if there's any cover-up and any sort of sanctions coming from that, I think that's where it'll come from, the Title IX department. Right. To me, it's just ridiculous. Like, I mean, if these guys got bought a free dinner or were selling pants for tattoos, Mark Emmert would have shut this down years ago. But since it's something uncomfortable, like to discuss, like a sexual assault, domestic assault type thing, here we are years later, you know, it's, it's outrageous. And I don't know what the right answer is, you know, like I said, shutting down, giving them like the death penalty or something. You're punishing kids who wanted to go there who didn't have anything to do with it. You know, these assaults span 20 years. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you on that, that it, it semi-punishes the kids. I mean, they're still getting a good college education. They're still playing at a top university. Right. And they're still living out that dream, per se, to play for Penn State or Baylor or, or Michigan State. Um, Unless they're a lower-tier player whose scholarship got taken. Right. Um, and the, I feel like the NCAA has done a great job over the last few years. I don't know how long they've been doing this, but... Where if sanctions come about, players are allowed to transfer and they don't have to be penalized with the whole sit out for a year type thing. But, I mean, something needs to be done. And sometimes there's collateral damage in these kind of things. And to me, that collateral damage of, oh, this kid doesn't get to play for the school that he wanted to play for, it it 
it pales in comparison to what the actual right. crime was that we're punishing here. And it sometimes, like I said, there's just collateral damage. And if it prevents other schools from allowing this to happen further down the road, then I think it's collateral damage that's worth it. I don't know if this is going to stop it, but clearly what we're doing right now is not working. And I can't imagine how many other universities are doing the same thing. How many universities right now have Most. administrators looking at this report going, we need to start deleting emails. We need to start deleting files. We need to start doing our own cover up, like continue covering up even more because we know we're doing the same thing. Let's try to double our efforts into covering this up so we don't get exposed like these guys got exposed. I mean, statistically, it has to be most schools are dealing with this, right? You got schools that have 40,000 students. Right. You have athletic departments that are thousands of students. I mean, just statistically, people there are committing crimes. You don't hear about this stuff every day. So it's got to be most programs covering things up like this. Maybe not to this extent. I mean, this is obviously an extreme case. Mm. But uh, what do you think? You think D'Antonio and Izzo both survive this? Or one goes, or they both go, or... Uh, Right now, I feel like the answer is yes, they both go because you can't have you can't have the president and the AD step down, basically admitting that they knew something was going on and have the two biggest head coaches that are pretty much I would say the rank and file at Michigan State would go D'Antoni at the bottom, Izzo second, and then AD and president um, above them. So... How could the two people at the top know, but the two guys in the middle not know kind of deal? Right. I think D'Antonio is gone um, for sure. Uh, so he took over in 2007. They've had 16 players accused of sexual or domestic assault since then. And uh, it came up in the report. Like, they deal with a lot of that in-house. And the, his discipline for one player accused of sexual assault was he made the guy talk to his mom about it. Yeah, I saw and that. And that was it. Like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah, that's embarrassing and it sucks, but it's nothing criminal. Like, it's no suspension. It's no, like, that's it. He had to tell his mom. I think D'Antonio's out. And I think with, um, you know, with Paterno, with Rick Pitino, I think we've proved that nobody here is, you know, infallible. Nobody's above the law. And I think Izzo's got a lot to worry about right now. Yeah. Right now, I don't, we'll see. Again, I mean, we're at the tip Pitino of the iceberg. Took Patino took shoe money and he's gone. You're telling me right. Izzo's going to survive this? Well, I mean, you mentioned how the NCAA jumps all over kids for taking taking money. I mean, Mark Emmerich said that when the FBI investigation came out that this was disgusting. And then when he hears about Michigan State's allegation, he says, I, I need more information before I can make a comment on this. So, this guy's a total ass clown. I mean, look, the NCAA, and I've heard this a lot, the NCAA shouldn't be policing crimes on campuses. If it's involving student athletes, yeah, they should. If you've committed a crime, I'm sorry, but you're just as ineligible as a kid who got a $50 dinner bought for him by a booster. I feel like he should be even more ineligible. Like, Will Greer got suspended for an entire year, a whole calendar year, because he had an illegal substance of performance enhancing drugs in his system. We're saying that guy who may or may not have accidentally taken the wrong supplement is out for a year, but a kid who got sexually sexually assaulted somebody and just got to talk to, to mom. had to tell his mom, you're telling me the NCAA can't can't police that, can't do anything about that? Like no, we need to stop allowing players to do whatever the hell they want and be eligible to play football the next Saturday. Yeah, it seems like these schools, you know, going back to Penn State, Florida State, all these schools are just so much more concerned with preserving the image of the university that they do anything for it. And at some point, you know, the heads have started to roll, thankfully, but they need to clean house at Michigan State. And they need to send a clear message that this is not acceptable. Like Penn State did a great job separating themselves completely. They cut off the head, you know, they got rid of everyone involved right. in the whole Sandusky thing. And they said it's not acceptable, and they got a bunch of class act people to come in there and get that program on the right track. Um, Michigan State needs to do the same. Needs to send a message to everyone that it's not acceptable. Yeah, they can turn this crisis into an opportunity. They to, can, to, like, take the next step and be at the forefront of you know, and that's shining the light on it. And that's where my frustration has been with the board of trustees and the president and D'Antonio and Izzo, for that matter, is. 
they could have taken this stance of we are completely horrified that this happened under our watch. We are going to do whatever it takes to make sure this never happens again and make it all about the victims. And they've made it all about themselves. They've all doubled down on their they, they wanted to talk about fake news and the media is just coming after us. And we're we've done so many great things for the university and, and everything else. I said in the, in the pre-show, we could talk about this for the whole entire hour, but we got a lot more to talk about. Um, this is a moving, fluid story. It's going to just continue to grow and grow, and I, th I think this is going to get uglier for people at Michigan State before it gets better. And yeah, absolutely. I don't know what the right answer is, but hopefully people with more sense than what we've seen step forward and make it right. Uh, we talked about Baylor. My punishment for Baylor that I've handed out is unless I'm talking about their rape allegations and their cover up, I don't mention their names. So Florida played this crappy school from Texas yesterday and kicked the shit out of them. It was the SEC versus Big 12 challenge yesterday, and Florida got to play this really shitty Christian school from Texas that did lots of shitty things, and we kicked their asses at home, took care of business. Um, and the SEC went six and four yesterday in this Big 12 challenge. I've been kind of critical of SEC basketball, but hey, man, getting six wins out of 10 against a conference like the Big 12 is not bad. Yeah, and even uh, in their losses, South Carolina had a pretty good showing against uh, a ranked Texas Tech team. Mm. Um, I think the big win for the SEC was uh, Alabama, and they got a stud freshman uh, point guard in Colin Sexton. You had two of the top freshman point guards going against each other. They beat Oklahoma with uh, Trey Young, who we've talked a lot about. Everyone's talked a lot about Trey Young. Um, but, yeah, Alabama getting that win in the challenge was big. Yeah, Sexton, yeah, had 18, yeah, Sexton had 18 points in that game. It was at home at, at Alabama. Tuscaloosa must have been going crazy. Um, so that's a big win. Another big win was, I've said it before and I'll say it again, man. It is tough to win in West Virginia. And West Virginia, Kentucky went into West Virginia yesterday and they beat them 83 to 76 big win over number seven, West Virginia. Um, Knox had 34 points. That's insane to think about when you're talking about college basketball, but, uh, but Knox, West Virginia, especially with that press, they're not an easy team to score. No. So putting up 83 total. And then you know 34 just from Knox. I mean, yeah, Kevin Knox, a, a freshman forward, which is no surprise when you're talking about Kentucky, 34 points. And hell, man, Javon Carter came out for West Virginia swinging, too. He had 26 points, seven assists. But UK, man, UK was down uh, was down 17, came roaring back against in a, in a hostile environment like West Virginia and, and won that game. Uh, Auburn, uh, Auburn was the only team that didn't play. Auburn LSU played and played each other. That was pretty funny. Uh, Arkansas beating Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State had that big win against Oklahoma and turned around and loses to Arkansas at home. Or, sorry, uh, on the road. Yeah, you got to wonder if Oklahoma State kind of gave everything they had in that win against uh, Oklahoma. It's their biggest game of the year. They were on national TV, I believe. Trey Young coming to town. So, yeah, big win for the Razorbacks. And I got good news for you, Sean. Yes, you do. Uh, the last time Virginia had a win at Duke was 1995. Flash forward to 23 years later, and Virginia sneaks out a win at Duke. But our boy Tuna would like to hear this. Duke was a home underdog. They covered. What would you think about that game? Um, I think I've been critical of Virginia. I don't – I've – you know, they're a defensive team, and sometimes that doesn't translate to deep runs in the tournament. It usually, you know, I've been high on Virginia before, and I've been burned by them, putting them in my final four and all that. But, man, they shut Duke down. Grayson Allen only had five points, which always makes me smile. Played 40 minutes, only scored five points. Marvin Bagley is a stud for Duke. Yes, um, he is. He had 30 points, 14 rebounds. I mean, this yeah. kid, he's in the running for a number one pick. He'll definitely be, like, a top four. But, man, Virginia. They spread it out. You know, no one had more than 17 points. It's that lockdown defense. And, yeah, hats off to them. Winning uh, over at Duke, not an easy thing to do, as obviously said they haven't done in 23 years. Yeah, you look at the uh, the half splits, the scores for each half. 
Cavaliers went in with a 10-point cushion, 32-22 at half. And Duke did everything they could to charge back. It was a 41-33 second half, but just not enough. Didn't come up with enough points. And the final score, 65-63. to And Bagley has all but diminished Grayson, Grayson Allen's existence on Duke. Grayson Allen came back. Is this his senior year? Uh, I think he's a junior. Anyways. Um, but so he's most come, likely his last year. Or he's a senior. Yeah. yeah, so he's a senior. He came back for his senior year, and he's all but disappeared on this team. I, I can't remember the last time people were saying, man, Grayson Allen, what a hell of a game by this guy. Anytime Duke has gone up against the top-rated team, Grayson Allen has just disappeared. Florida made him disappear. He's disappeared in this game. Um. Maybe we'll see this guy in the big three league sometime, sometime soon. Yeah, I mean, he's still having a pretty good year. He's still averaging uh, just about 15 points per game. But yeah, he's no longer the focal point of that offense. Uh, they were talking two years ago and last year that he's possibly like a late to mid first round pick. And that's gone now. I mean, he put up all his points early against garbage teams. Yeah. And I mean, his if you look through his highest scoring games, he did have the 37 against Michigan State. He was awesome in that game to open up the season but other than that like 25 against south dakota um yeah i'm surprised you're not cheered for grayson he's a florida guy uh from jacksonville i mean is that really florida that's more like south south georgia jacksonville is if you've ever been there it's oh, it, it's a different place no i love jacksonville it's cool but um <clears throat> other scores around the league uh cincinnati got it done against memphis arizona Barely squeaks out against Utah, 74-73. I'm looking around here. Oh, NC State. Big win against UNC, number 10 UNC, 95-91. to uh, Big scores for NC State were Torin Doran and Markel Johnson. Both scored 20 points each. And then Al Freeman came in with 29 points. Man, when you get three players to get you 69 points, you should win. You should win that game. Yeah, I don't think... North Carolina came in as the 10th ranked team. I don't think they're that good. Um, that was an overtime game. Um, and that was at North Carolina. I yeah. Believe. Mm-hmm. At North yeah, Carolina. So it's a good road win for the Wolfpack. Um, I don't know. North Carolina might be one of those teams come tournament time that I have uh, exiting pretty early first or second round. I don't, I don't buy into them. I don't think they have a stud player who can carry them deep into the tournament. No, I mean, I don't know. Luke, they're kind of a ho-hum North Carolina team. Luke May had a solid 31 point game yesterday, but wasn't enough. He's he, wildly inconsistent. Yeah, he only had help from Theo Penson. He scored 22, and then the rest of the team were single digits. The only other double digit uh, player for, for UNC was Cameron Johnson with his 12 points. Um, you're going to need a lot more help than that, especially when it comes to tournament time, like you said. Yeah, Luke May, he's. He has the capability to go for 30 like he did, but he's, I mean, he's had multiple games this year where he's been held single digits, and that's not going to get it done. Right. Uh, let alone, you know, the NCAA tournament, let alone the AC, ACC tournament. So, we'll see. Well, I, I brought up the big three, and we had a huge, huge announcement this week of another professional league getting started up, and that is, of course, the XFL Vince McMahon came out and dropped the bomb. We kind of knew this was coming when he started selling off a hundred million dollars worth of shares for the WWE and started up this own, this new entertainment company. And he makes the announcement kind of excited, but also kind of leery. There was some things that I liked hearing about what he said. There was other things where I feel like he's going to miss the point on. And what was your, what were your thoughts on, on his league proposal? Overall, I had a positive reaction to it um, because he's trying to make it less of a sideshow than the XFL was the first time around, which I was a huge fan of it the first time, but I was also 11 years old. So um, he wants to focus more on the football side. So some of the things he proposed is uh, no halftime. So all games can be completed in two hours or less, which is good and bad. I like that I'll be able to watch an entire football game in two hours. It won't take me the entire day. You got to worry about injuries without having players rest and get treatment at halftime. Um, 
he wants to streamline the product. So he's uh, said there's going to be no cheerleaders or anything. It's going to be a family friendly type uh, game. Uh, then he also said things like there's no kneeling during the anthem. Uh, no players are allowed in the league with criminal record. The no criminal record one kills me because you're immediately eliminating Johnny Manziel, Plexco Burris, Mike Vick, and OJ. Are you kidding me? Like, that would be my starting team right there. But I think there's good and bad. I think he timed it well. I believe it's when the uh, NFLPA contract is up, is they're going to be their first year in 2020. So it'll give the NFL players some leverage. You might see a better deal out of that. But overall, I think the XFL coming back is a good thing. Um, at least the NFL can like learn and grow from it because the NFL got skycam from the XFL the first time around. Yeah. Um, my takeaway was just I'm excited to have a new football league. I'm excited to create some sort of competition because the NFL has just not given a damn about what us fans think or what their image is or anything like that because they know no matter what happens, they might take a little bit of a dip in ratings and stuff but we're still gonna watch we're still gonna come out and support them and everything so i think competition makes things better i promise you in the xfl vince mcmahon will tell us exactly what a catch is we'll never be questioning yeah. if it's a touchdown or not well i said from the get-go that that's what needs to happen is make a catch a catch and you're already one up against against the nfl so make it happen man yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm hoping that uh, Chicago, we get the enforcers back. They had a disappointing run uh, in the original XFL. But I think uh, I think Chicago's a good market. I think your Orlando, uh, they had the rage the first time in XFL legend, Jeff Brom. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, those would be some good fits. And I think I would hope they'd meet in the million-dollar game. Yeah, Chicago versus Orlando would be a lit championship game. And the other thing I like that he's doing different this year is that, or this time around, is that he's going to do it during the spring. And I love how everybody is criticizing it. Like, who's going to watch this? There's going to be no superstars. And it's going to be second or third rate football talent. And I sit there and I think, I don't go to... I don't sit there and I don't complain about McDonald's every time I go eat at McDonald's because I know I can't have a five-star restaurant every night. So when it's the middle of March, middle of April, and I'm craving that football, I'm not going to care if this is the third or fourth best talent or rated talent in the country. Hell, you and I watch college football and love college football. Millions yeah, you and ever been millions. To a minor league? You ever been to a minor league baseball or hockey game? Those oh, things are awesome. They're awesome. They're great because it's it's number one, it's cheap. I love any sport where I can get in under $100 with my family. And uh, it's just like why we love college football. Players that are trying to prove themselves try harder than players that have already made it. And I don't hear anybody complaining on Saturdays when it's Ole Miss versus Arkansas complaining about how it's third or fourth or fifth rate talent. Because let's face it, there's only three or four players on both squads that have any legitimate shot at making the NFL. The rest are just third or fourth rate players. Even at Alabama, as great as Alabama has been, it's still third or fourth rate talent for the most part because they're college athletes. They're amateurs, allegedly. Yeah, I love me some good matchin on a Tuesday night. So now, now we're talking like ninth or tenth rate players, but I still like I'm just as excited to watch a little matchin. So let's let's find some good talent. I mentioned the big three. I thought the big three did the went the wrong direction. They found these old retired slow, big-name basketball players that nobody wants to see. I thought they should have gone the other route and found the plethora of basketball players that we grew to know and love during March Madness that just didn't have what it takes to make it into into the NBA for, for whatever reason. Let's bring back those big names. So I think that's what... Jimmer. That's right, Jimmer. I think that's what we need to do with this new XFL League. Don't Don't try to compete and find these old names. Don't go get... Don't go get Vince Young or Jamarcus Russell. Don't go get that those guys old and, and washed up. And don't go get these safe quarterbacks out of the NFL that are third stringers. Don't go get Mark Sanchez. I don't want to see that guy. I want to see these exciting college athletes that for whatever reason didn't make it. So 
Let's start off with our little uh, draft. I'm going to be Orlando. You be Chicago. I'll let you have the first pick. All right. Well, with my first pick, I'm going to do exactly what you said you hate, and I'm going to go with an old guy. Mm. And my starting quarterback, my number one pick, is going to be Warren Moon. What? CFL Hall of Famer. NFL Hall of Famer. Every league he goes to, he turns it on its head, and he gets into the Hall of Fame. There's no better linchpin to my team than starting quarterback Warren Moon. Have you seen that guy lately? Uh, no. He makes Jared uh, Jared Lorenzen look, look like a supermodel. But really, my first pick is uh, Kane Coulter, former oh. quarterback out of uh, Northwestern. Okay. Uh, he also played running back and wide receiver at Northwestern. He's one of these tweener guys where he had incredible college stats. He led Northwestern some great seasons. And because he's a little bit on the smaller side, he got no shot at the NFL. Um, and I think his type of athleticism and his versatility would be awesome in the XFL. Just turn him loose. I'm going to swoop in underneath you here and uh, go a different route. My first pick is going to be head coach Lane Kiffin. Ooh, Picking up Lane train. Kiffin, bringing him out of FAU, giving him that shot uh, to play or to coach in professional football again. I don't think he ever has another shot at the NFL for another 20 years. He'd have to win a lot at, at the college level before anybody gives him a shot. So Lane Kiffin, I'm giving you that professional football shot. And if you could prove that you can do it in the XFL, that's going to be a, a faster step up to the NFL than what you got in college football at FAU. So come on down, Mr. Lane Kiffin. All right. I like it. Um, I think with my second pick, I'm going to be taking a running back, and I'm going to poach him off of one of your favorite teams. Uh-oh. And that's Trent Richardson from the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Oh, nice. I think he would be an awesome fit in the XFL. Um, if there was a player built for the XFL, the high contact running, uh, without having any vision at all, is Trent Richardson. All right. So since you're going Trent Richardson, I'm going to swoop one out of your neck of the woods. I'm taking Wisconsin Badger Monte Ball. Bringing Monte Ball back was a 2,000-yard rusher in 2012. Hasn't really done much in the NFL. I think he's been out since 2015. So I want to see him get a resurgence back in the XFL. Monty Ball, come on down. You're now on the Orlando Rage. All right. Um, obviously, I'm going to have to address the wide receiver position here. So I have a few choices. Um, but I think I'm going to go Ocho Cinco. Ocho in, Cinco? Still going the old guys, huh? Ocho Cinco is in great shape. Uh, I think he could still play in the league on some of these shitty teams. But he could definitely play a year or two in the XFL. He sells tickets. I mean, man, Ocho Cinco in the XFL, it was, there's not a better pair together. It was the Chicago Enforcers, right? That's right. The Chicago Enforcers brought to you by AARP, where <laughs> all the trusted seniors put their trust and in information for all things retired retirees, man. You're, you're going old school. I, I do like the Ocho Cinco pick better than the Warren Moon pick. I think, I think Ocho Cinco could do better. But Plus, I, I like it. Also, my kicker. Oh, nice. Yeah, wide receiver. Two, kicker. two for one, right there. Yeah, you got to be efficient. All right, so I'm gonna go for quarterback. I've been going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So for now, I'm, I'm gonna make two picks at quarterback, but I won't tell you my second pick. So first of all, I'm gonna go Timothy Richard Tebow. Of course, got to bring him in. He will sell tickets, and I think with lesser talent on defense that he's gonna be playing against. He's going to do well. So I'm going to make that my pick for right now at quarterback. My next pick will be another quarterback, but I'll let you have your next pick if you have one. Yeah, there were a few quarterbacks I was looking at um, to serve as my backup. There's Braxton Miller, who is very similar to Kane Coulter, another guy who had excellent quarterback numbers in college, led his team to the highest level, but they decided before he even showed up for the combine that he's not a quarterback. I was also considering any of the Hawaii quarterbacks. Uh, yes. Timmy Chang, Colt Brennan. I mean, having those guys spin the ball out there. But if I'm going backup quarterback this round, I'm going Brady Quinn. Oh, that guy throws you're going pretty, Notre Dame? A pretty Well, it was either him or Jimmy Clausen. Oh, that's uh, true. <laughs> so go with the younger guy. Yeah, Quinn's younger. He throws a pretty spiral. And that's going to play well on that sky cam that the XFL originated. Um. Yeah, I think Brady Quinn would be my backup because uh, Warren Moon can only like come out for the ceremonial first snap, and then he's got to sit his ass on the bench. I like it. So I went veteran quarterback uh, with playoff wins, legend in his own right, Hall of Famer, all the way with Tim Tebow. 
And what do you do when you have an older guy at quarterback? You draft the younger, more flashy guy so he can develop under under your veteran. And so I'm going with UCF quarterback Mackenzie Milton. He'll be coming right out of college. I don't. The guy's too short. I love the guy, but the NFL has a thing against short quarterbacks, and understandably so for the most part. So Mackenzie Milton, don't yeah, nobody get, like Drew Brees or Russ Wilson has had success. Mackenzie Milton, don't try to uh, don't don't fall for the evil empire. They'll probably try to make you their next Chris Hogan and put you in that slot and run around. No, don't do that, buddy. Stay a quarterback and come play for the Orlando Rage. Mackenzie Milton will develop under Tim Tebow and after a year or two take over and light the XFL world on fire, become an XFL Hall of Famer. I like it. It's not a bad pick. Um, I think the XFL would be wise to try to start getting some of these underclassmen to come there or the college graduates, you know, instead of trying to be a walk on like a practice squad member, you know, go post these guys, pay them some money. I think it'd be fun. Um, My last pick was another wide receiver to pair with Ocho Cinco. And I had to get at least one Illini legend on my team. And I thought at first it was going to be Juice Williams, the last uh, quarterback to take him to the Rose Bowl. But instead I'm going with former Illini great and first-round draft pick, A.J. Jenkins, wide receiver. Um, he was a first-round pick by the 49ers. He kind of fizzled out in the league uh, due to some like horrible quarterback play. He got traded from the Niners to the Titans or someone. I don't know, some other garbage team. But he put up insane numbers. Uh, he was on the Blitnikoff watch list when he was at Illinois. If he had Ocho Cinco to learn mm-hmm. under, and he's got Brady Quinn throwing the ball to him, XFL Hall of Famer. I like it. All right, so my wide receiver pick. I haven't made that one yet. We'll finish it off there. I'm going I'm going from your neck of the woods. Uh, he went to high school in Chicago. He went to, is it Crete Monet? Crete Monet. Crete Monet. Uh, he was a five-star wide receiver. He was the number one wide receiver, according to Rivals, back when he was recruited. Uh, went down to Ole Miss. Probably got wow. paid. Probably got paid lots of money to go to Ole Miss. Has done really nothing in the NFL, so he's still a Minnesota Viking. Didn't do much for them. Uh, so by 2020, by the time that rolls around, Laquan Treadwell, come on down, buddy. Bring in your speed and your agility. Big and, guy. Uh, big guy. Yeah, he's six two. Uh, 215 pounds right now, according to Wikipedia. We all know how true that place is. But come on down, man. Chicago athlete, Ole Miss, SEC speed. Let's go. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I like it. Um, I'm excited for the XFL mm. to come back. I'm excited for my inevitable XFL fantasy league. The uh, regular fantasy league that I've been dominating for the last, like, 12 years is called the XFFL, the Extreme nice. Fantasy Football League. Nice. Um, so I'm pumped. I'm ready for it. Uh, I can't wait. I'm going to watch it no matter what. So, yeah, I'm going to watch no matter what. I'm going to. I already told Kyle we're going to get uh, season tickets. We're we're pushing right now to become the voice of the Orlando Rage. We got our own uh, our own hashtag hashtag XFL2020 Orlando, but we you know made it cool to where the zero is part of the 2020 and part of the Orlando. So it's Very great. Sure. I'm excited, man. Um, and I think the XFL, if they play their cards right, they have an opportunity. They say, where are they going to find big name stars from? They're going to find them from underclassmen, I think. Last year or the year before that, everybody talked about, like, will Leonard Fournette forego his final season of of uh, his junior year? They said the same thing about um, Dave and Clowney. Should he yep. forego his junior year because he's already NFL ready, but the NFL won't allow him. If the XFL can find those guys and just bite the bullet and say, hey, we'll take on the year. We'll do what the NCAA does in basketball. We'll have a one and done system. We'll pay for you to come play for us for a year. And then you can go enter yourself in the NFL draft. What player wouldn't want to do that, to be honest with you? I guarantee you Fournette and Jadavian Clowney would have signed with the XFL if the XFL is willing to do that. And I think they should be able, they should be willing to do that if they want to legitimize their league. Well, you can also go down to uh, the the top high school recruits. Like you're telling me there's a five-star recruit who comes from a really poor family somewhere in like the middle of nowhere in the South. And he sees, okay, I can go to Alabama <clears throat> for three years where I'll sit on the bench for two and I'll play one year and then maybe go to the NFL. Or I can go to the XFL where it'll give me, a million dollars over these two years to go play. That's life changing money. Right. So I, I think they'd be wise to target those guys. Um, 
and kind of almost act as like a developmental league as well as, you know, showcasing top level talent. And if they wanted to one up the NCAA, they can pay them and pay their way for college. They can say, hey, you come play for the Chicago Enforcers and we'll pay for you to go to NIU or Northwestern or whatever college your choice in the city of Chicago. We'll pay for that. Yeah. You want to come play for Orlando? Then we'll pay for you to go to Stetson. We'll pay for you to go to, to UCF. Whatever whatever school you want to go to in the Orlando area, we'll, we'll pay for you to go do it while you play football for us. And uh, Memphis Spence, he's been on our show before. He was saying on his station that I th- he thinks that this is going to change how the NCAA handles their players from here on out. And again, just like I said, it's a good thing to have competition for the NFL. It's an even better thing to have competition for NCAA. So I'm excited. I'm ready to go. But let's jump into our AP Top 25 preseason polls, man. Where are we at All now? Right. We did we did 16 through 20 last week, right? Yep, so we got 15 to 11 this week. So we're kicking off with Georgia at number 15. All right, so obviously they were wrong there. And yeah, so. I, I can't judge them for being wrong because I did not see Georgia – playing for national championship this year, but I'm also a Gator who hates Georgia and I can never see them being in a national championship game. So that's a big, big time swing and a miss as far as they underrated. They underrated Georgia. Yeah. Way underrated. Georgia was a similar team to me uh, as uh, Miami. They seemed like they were a year ahead of schedule. Um, Georgia's always had these big recruiting classes coming in. They have the number one recruiting class next year. Um, obviously, we saw them play for the title this year. Their only other loss was uh, Auburn, I believe, right? They lost to Auburn in the regular season. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, this was a, a big, big swing and a miss. This is drafting Sam Bowie ahead of Michael Jordan. Like, just the awful type of miss, the worst. Yeah, and then there's not, really not much else to say about it um, other than that it's just a huge miss. Georgia looks to be... Uh, though that they won't be ranked number fifteen preseason for a long time. No, no, no. Uh, I would say for the next three or four years, they'll probably come in top five um, yeah, every year. A lot of the questions and why they're ranked fifteen had to do with the quarterback situation. And uh, early in the season, Jake Fromm didn't do a lot to alleviate um, how we felt about that. And he wasn't even the starter week one, right? Eason started. No, Eason started, and Eason was had a really good season the year before that. It was the bigger surprise was that when Eason went down, that he never got his job back from from now Eason has transferred from, from Georgia to Washington. And it's now a, a, it's now from's job with Justin Fields, the number one recruit coming in for Georgia, um, which is really surprising when Georgia hired coach smart, Kirby smart. If you would have said, yeah, this guy's going to come in and he's going to recruit the top quarterback three years in a row. I would have laughed in your face, but somehow, some way, this defensive coordinator, longtime defensive coordinator for Alabama, Alabama who never recruits quarterbacks well, is recruiting better than what, I don't know, Pete Carroll was doing at USC as far as quarterback goes. Yeah, and I mean, from he had a good season. He did exactly what was asked of him. He was extremely efficient. He held on to the ball. Um, and they kind of turned him loose a little bit in the championship game. You saw a glimpse of what he's capable of going forwards. So I, I, you know, people are saying like Fields is going to take this job. He's the number one quarterback. I think it's Fromm's job, uh, hands down. How do you bench a guy who took you to the championship, who had you in a position to win the championship? Um, I think there's a lot, uh, going for Georgia right now. And I think Fromm's going to be front and center for all of it. Yep. Next on the list was, uh, Number 14, Stanford, and this is another big swing in the miss by the AP Top 25. Again, not without merit. I, I Going into the season, I would have agreed that that would be right where Stanford was at, so I can't hate on the AP too much because we all missed on Sam, Stanford. They finished the season 9-5 and five on a two-game losing streak. A lot of that did have to do with the fact that Bryce Love had some injury problems throughout the season. But Bryce Love pl- played against TCU, and they had the big lead. And when you have the big lead and the best running back or one of the best running backs in the nation, you should be able to run out that clock and secure that lead. And they weren't able to do that against TCU. Stanford's one of those teams where I don't I don't know where they go from here. Yeah, so 
five losses on the year. Um, the real bad one was San Diego State. Um, mm. Mm. But their last two games, they lost the uh, Pac-12 title game to USC in a very close game, uh, and they lost late to TCU in the Alamo Bowl. Five losses, but they still finished ranked 20th. I think they were the only five-loss team in the rankings. So the AP, you know, as bad as Stanford looked down the stretch, the AP was only six spots off their ranking. So I gave them a hit on this, but it's like when the outfielder loses the ball in the sun and doesn't even make a play on it. Like, yeah, it counts <laughs> as a hit, but, like, but, nobody's happy yeah, about it. On. It doesn't matter. Um, but they, they went as Bryce Love went. They had that really close game against a terrible Oregon State team when Bryce Love was out. Um, so he's coming back, which is good for them. He's going to be a Heisman front runner, but it's going to be the same thing. If he's injured next year, it's going to be the same sort of thing. They're going to go as he goes. If he has a great game, they'll probably win. If he doesn't, they're going to lose. Yep. Coming up next is number 13 LSU and Coach Coach O's first season finished off nine and four. I would say nine and four. No, that's like a bottom top 25 team if you're nine and four. So I would say this was a miss. Uh, We talked about how Stanford lost to San Diego State. LSU had the big loss to Troy. And we thought at that point, I was thinking like six and six was best case scenario for LSU. But again, at the time, I didn't realize the SEC was as bad as as it was. And LSU was able to beat up on a very down SEC. They went 6-2 and two in SEC play, um, beating up on the likes of Texas A&M and Ole Miss and Arkansas. And they even beat Auburn. They were the only loss that Auburn had in the SEC. So, overall, I, I think this is... Uh, one of those where they they hit the ball. And you talk about the the outfielder, the outfielder uh, caught it or missed the play. I think this is the one where the outfielder kind of did that sliding catch, where yeah, the track, half yeah, catch. Half, half catch, sliding on the ground, getting the ball, kind of miss. Nine and four is a little too high for a thirteenth ranked team. I don't know where they ended up. We'll have to double check to see where they ended up in 18. that. Eighteen. They ended up eighteen. So when you think about it, it's five five spots off, but even eighteen, I feel like, is too high for a nine and four team that lost their last game against Notre Dame. Yeah, so LSU's uh, only impressive win was the Auburn game. Um, they didn't really have a signature win other than that. Um, they're losing guys to the NFL, so they got a huge hole to fill on an offense that has never really relied on uh, big time quarterback play. So they got to fill that hole at running back. Um. The Citrus Bowl that they lost to Notre Dame was on that ridiculous Notre Dame uh, catch on the sideline. So if they win that Citrus Bowl, I think they probably finish maybe as a top 10 team. So that ranged from 10 to 18 where they finished. To me, this is a hit the AP only missed by five. Um, this is a hit like the one that concussed XFL legend Jeff Brown before he came back. <laughs> does he still have a pulse? Yes, yes he does. Yes, he Let's, does. Play, Let's football. play football. Uh, that's Orlando Rage legend Jeff Brom to you, sir. Purdue coaching legend Jeff Brom. Yeah. All right, let's move on to Auburn, number 12. This one was a solid home run. Uh, straight down, straight down center field, home run. Number 12 is where they started out, and number 12 is pretty much where I think they finished. Uh, finished 10, yeah. Finished 10. They ended the season with a 10-4 um, and four record. A two-game losing streak. They lost to they lost to um, co-national champion UCF. They beat other co-national champion Alabama. So all in all, number twelve can't hate on that pick. Yeah, they got losses to uh, they lost at Clemson. So shout out to uh, Auburn for actually playing a real non-conference uh, team. So they lost at Clemson early. Uh, they lost at LSU. Then in the SEC championship, and of course the bowl games at UCF. Beating Bama is always good. Uh, they looked like a playoff contender most of the year, and they were. I mean, if they had won the SEC championship, they were in the playoffs. Well, so. they they were ten and four, and they played uh, two teams that were in the playoff, and one team that should have been in the playoff. So you can't hate on that. Two of their losses were to these playoff eligible teams. And like I said, they beat one co national champion and lost to another. So. And it was a highly competitive loss on the road at Clemson. I think it was like 14-6. Right. Yeah, it was 14-6. to six, Very boring game. Highly defensive game. So you played 
Yeah, so you played three, sorry, three uh, playoff teams. You lost to, to, to two of them, and you lost to a co-national champion. Hey, that's a solid solid hit, like I said. A loud they also home beat run. two playoff teams because they beat Georgia during the year. Right, they did, yep. And beat Bama, so. Yeah, so very good season. Like I said, a loud, solid home run over center field wall for the AP on, on Auburn. Yeah, they finished uh, at 10, so I think this is the AP's masterpiece so far. Um, this is a hit, and I apologize for getting stuck in your head and stuck in everyone's head for the rest of the day, but this is a hit like Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls on TLC. <laughs> this is mega hit. They nailed this one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, next one coming up, Michigan, number 11. And... Uh, yeah, it, this is a miss. This is a loud out for me. It, the the hit sounded good, it went far, but all in all, the the outfielder just stood calmly at the warning track and and just caught it. Just a loud out for Michigan. Yeah, finished the finished the season eight and five, three game losing streak, uh, and it and a, a comeback win or a comeback loss to South Carolina against Will Muschamp, inexcusable. Yeah, so their only ranked win for Michigan was uh, their opening game against a Florida team that had no business being ranked. Yep. Um, I think the fans in Ann Arbor are starting to get anxious with Harbaugh. This was another season uh, similar to Michigan's last couple seasons where they had a great defense that was sabotaged by bad quarterback play. O'Corn couldn't get it done. Peters couldn't get it done. Hmm. Right now, they got to be hoping that Shea Patterson gets his waiver. Uh, he's in the process of trying to get the waiver to play this upcoming season. So he doesn't have to sit out. Um, but yeah, this was a bad miss. This is a miss as bad as Vince McMahon not letting Johnny Football play in the XFL. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, this is a bad overall miss. Uh, again, with Michigan at 11 at the beginning of the season, just like Stanford, you kind of agreed with it. But reality reared its ugly head. And that ugly head is that Michigan and Jim Harbaugh need to find a quarterback. And so far, he just hasn't found that guy yet to lead him. If they're not compete, if Shea Patterson plays this year and they don't compete for a Big Ten title, don't be surprised to hear about Harbaugh being on a hot seat. Yeah, he's not going to get fired. I I would think it would take an zero and twelve season for Harbaugh to to actually get fired. But yes, if he finishes eight and five again, and or less, I mean yeah. they're fourth in the Big Ten East. Yeah, like. That's that's not what they signed up for. And Harbaugh's got a history of uh, kind of running himself out of town after four or five years. So they're they're expecting big things next year. Um, if he struggles next year and gets off to a bad start in 2019, could be gone midseason. All right. Overall, with this five that we've just graded, this I think this has been the worst. And I can't judge the AP because... It's easy to pick your top 10, and in some cases, it's easy to pick your, like, 18 through 25. It's those middle-of-the-road teams where you kind of don't know who to put there. You have teams that you believe in and you think can make a run at it, like your Georgia. Georgia was that team that you put you put at 15 because that's a safe place to put Georgia when you when you go back in time to, to August and you think about what your thoughts of with Georgia. You thought Georgia was a solid team. You thought a win here or a win there could catapult them into the top 10 and everything else. So I'm not going to be too harsh on them, but I have to be because they were they were basically one and four in that. And so I was going to give them an F, but since they hit Auburn out of the park, that's uh, five plus bonus points. They scored a 65. I'm giving them five plus <laughs> bonus points for Auburn. Uh, so that brings them up to a 70 D minus. Yeah, it seems like they just went a lot of big, safe names here with the Michigans, the Stanfords. Um, and those almost, to me, are like scared rankings. Like, it's much safer to put Michigan at 11 than to put – or like Stanford at 14 than to put Memphis in at 14. Because if Memphis loses two games and plummets out of the rankings, you look like an idiot. But, right. or you, you know, Stanford can freaking make the rankings at the end of the year with five losses. Or you look down on – you look down at the uh, the list and you see – South Florida at 19, maybe they should have been given LSU or Auburn slot. Maybe we should have, I mean, I can't say UCF because UCF was six and seven the year, year prior, but you know, right. you look at teams like Memphis or USF, some of these middle of the road, San Diego States, and maybe you give them those slots that LSU and, and Stanford and, and, and 
uh, Michigan took. But like right. like we said, you go with the safe picks when you're in that middle of the road ranking type type area. Yeah, it's I mean it's very trendy to put those San Diego State type teams at 19 to 23 and Well, cuz I like I said it's easy to pick your top 5 to top 10 because you know right. who which teams are going to be good and it's and then you kind of can just get away with picking 19 through 25 because nobody really cares. Nobody really looks down that low on yeah. the rankings unless you're looking for your team. But that middle of the ground you just got to pick safe. So Stanford, LSU, Auburn, Michigan, those are teams that make you feel warm and fuzzy inside and you feel okay with ranking them because you know if they lose four games or five games like LSU did, they'll still hang around that 15 right. 16 spot. So All right man, you got any game balls? I do. I have a game ball for Judge Rosemary and Kia, the judge in the Larry Nassar case. And uh, there's some people who are upset with her conduct. I don't know how much of her uh, stuff you saw on TV. Yeah, it's but all they're saying it. she was unprofessional. And some are even saying she undermined justice with the pleasure she took in sentencing him with the utter disdain that she had for uh, Larry Nassar during the whole um, proceedings. I mean, this guy is the type of like, he's not worth scraping the shit off your shoe like this guy is scum so i was happy to see her um lay down the law she shut down his request to uh not have the victim speak because he didn't think he could mentally handle it are you kidding me considering the feelings of this guy so i was happy when she shut it down um but yeah people are saying she said it was like her honor and privilege to sentence him and i just signed your death warrant was her big quote you know good for her <clears throat> this guy is the lowest form of scum and Keep doing her, you know, in the words of one of our greatest uh, contemporary poets and bards, Taylor Swift, haters going to hate, 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 keep doing you <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, this I, guy I think, doesn't deserve anybody's sympathy. I think people are missing the mark as to what a judge is supposed to do. They're supposed to judge. They're supposed to judge whether or not this person's getting a fair trial. They're supposed to judge whether or not um, the evidence is allowed in or not allowed in. And they're also supposed to judge that individual when they're convicted and that's what she was doing she was judging him she's not there to hold his hand and make sure he feels okay about his sentence she's there to hand down judgment and it's not just hand down the sentence but hand down the judgment of what a douchebag you are what a scumbag what like i can think of a thousand different adjectives to describe this guy in a negative light and it still wouldn't be enough words to truly to truly describe what kind of piece of piece of shit he is so yeah i mean good game ball um now i'm kind of wishing i went first because mine's not as serious <laughs> mine's gonna be uh dan mullen uh during right. the basketball game florida played that scumbag team from texas and dan mullen was there just pumping up the crowd taking pictures with the rowdy reptiles taking pictures with the band doing the gator chomp and Man, ever since this guy got onto campus, he has been a breath of fresh air. I don't know if this is going to win any games or result in championships, but from the last two guys, and I'll even say even from Urban Meyer, Urban Meyer isn't the type of guy that's who raw shish bob type guy. So right. like I said, I don't know if it translates into win, but it's when you have two guys that were kind of ho-hum, boring, wishy-washy, and they go bad. They do really shitty. Like, yeah, I don't. I, I want to see that guy that comes in and embraces the college, embraces the campus, embraces all the other sports, and I can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see what he has to do. He said we we beat Oklahoma. Number one Oklahoma gymnastics team came in and lost to Florida, and he says that's what we do here at the Swamp. That's what we do here at Florida. Uh, number one teams come into Gainesville, and they go home with losses. And he wants to make sure that the football team turns into that. So he's my he's my uh, he gets my game ball today. I like it. I had a secondary one as well. Just a quick one for uh, Vince McMahon, regardless of how well the XFL does, you know, turning the system on its head. Let's do uh, it. The NFL and the NCAA are going to need to adapt regardless of how the XFL does. They're going to need to adapt. Right. So um, at least he's getting some change going for yep. and my, uh, uh, systems that desperately need it. And the NFL mafia needs to stay out of this. Leave it alone. Just let it, instead of just trying to get all your media goons to take care of the XFL like you did last time, just accept the competition 
and better yourself. So. McMahon versus Goodell next WrestleMania. Boom. Oh man, that would be so awesome. Have Tom Brady versus Tim Tebow, the MVP of the XFL versus the MVP of the NFL. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, that's the end of this episode. We'll look forward to see you guys next week. Go Gators. Go Alina. See ya. Later.